In my video about soft points for bear defense, I explained that round nose full metal jacket bullets like 45 and 9mm do not break bone well. I also mentioned that even a 22 hollow point will break bone well. Many of you may already know that expanding rounds can perform poorly sometimes when you try to make a brain shot on an animal that has a very thick skull. Water buffalo, for example, have very thick skulls, yet Hornady FTX 357 Magnum Lever Revolution hollow points will reliably penetrate into the brain from close range with a reasonable shot angle. After penetrating through the front of a water buffalo's skull, these rounds were reduced to fragments. Since I've made the video about soft points, I've seen some more things that I thought were very interesting, and I thought that I should share them with you. First of all, even in 22, with a 40 grain Veloster hollow point from a 6 inch barreled revolver can still break a thick cow bone. Second of all, in one of the videos that Kentucky Ballistics made, he shot a deer knee with a plus P hardcast 44 magnum round. The reason why this deer knee shattered the way it did was because the bullet shattered on impact with the bone. Obviously this is not supposed to happen. The entire purpose of hard cast rounds is to have deep penetration. If your hard cast bullets shatter on thick bone, say a leg or a shoulder of a large bear, the resulting fragments may or may not reach the heart. In a different video, a guy shot a 357 Magnum hard cast round into what appeared to be a cow's leg bone. The result was that the bullet shattered on impact and broke the bone. He recovered the bullet from the water jugs that were behind the bone. In yet another video, a guy shot a 10mm hardcast 200 grain underwood bullet out of a 4.5 inch barrel into various thick bones. The result was that the bullet was badly mangled but still together. He also shot a 44 Magnum 305 grain underwood round into those same bones from a 7.5 inch barrel, and he could not recover the bullet because, in my opinion, the bullet obviously shattered. There was clear ballistics gel behind those bones, and clearly the 44 Magnum did not penetrate into the gel. I want to make something really clear here. The problem with hard cast lead rounds being severely deformed or broken on impact with bone is happening with more than one company. The problem is not that a specific company is making poor bullets. I believe the fundamental problem here is that the more force you are inflicting on a hard cast bullet, the more chance it has of severely deforming or shattering. This is why I believe the 10mm round held together enough that it could be recovered, and the 44 simply shattered. So when we have a cartridge that is not exceedingly powerful, like a 40 Smith & Wesson, hard cast bullets will punch through thick bone without breaking the bone, and without shattering on impact more importantly. You could make several different arguments with this information, the most obvious being that 10mm is probably better than 44 Magnum against bears if you're using hard cast lead. Another argument would be that solid copper bullets like extreme penetrators or buffalo bore monometals are better than hard cast against bone. Yet another argument might be that people have killed bears and will continue to kill bears with hard cast lead rounds. Continuing with that train of thought, one could point out that there is no evidence that anyone has ever died because a hard cast lead round failed to kill a bear. A very obvious question that still needs answering would be why do some hard cast rounds break so reliably in testing, yet we don't have any complaints about them breaking after hitting thick bone in living animals. I frankly don't have an adequate answer to this question. So if someone has some personal experience or insight as to why this is happening, I'd very much like to hear it. A final argument would be that if your hard cast round shatters on thick bone, that could theoretically be a good thing because you can break shoulders or front legs, or something like a solid copper might just pass through it. Of all of these arguments, the last one here has the least value, as it's not a guarantee that a hard cast will do something that it's not designed to do and break apart. Now this is where things get really interesting. On a forum post, someone mentioned that he shot a 240 grain XDP hollow point through back to back elk femurs and it exited flat but in one piece. However, when he tried to do the same with a hard lead 240 grain bullet, it fragmented and exited in pieces. In this video, we had people shooting hollow points in what appeared to be pig leg bones in front of water jugs. They had 124 grain 9mm and 230 grain 45 HST hollow points.
9mm bullet shown here is expanded somewhat poorly due to the thick bone. Most importantly, it stayed in one piece. The 9mm stopped in the third jug, and the 45 exited the fourth water jug, but was not recovered. Their conclusion was that the 45 generally has more penetration than the 9mm did, which makes sense at a surface level. However, what likely happened was that the 45 had little or no expansion due to the bone, which meant it acted more like a full metal jacket instead of the 9mm that acted like a hollow point. Both the 45 and the 9mm shattered the bones, which is what we'd expect from these hollow points. So if we shoot very heavy 44 Magnum hard gas rounds into deer bone or thick cow bone only to have them shatter and give marginal penetration. Then we shoot hollow points into pig bone that's larger and thicker than deer bones, and we find that the hollow points are holding up pretty well. So we have to ask two questions. Is hard cast lead really the best for bear defense? And what would we really want in an ideal bear defense round? Before we go any further, I want to make a distinction. If you were hunting bears with a handgun, you could very logically make the argument that a deep penetrating bullet is necessary in the case that you need to shoot a bear lengthwise. For example, one situation would be if a black bear is about to hurt one of your hunting dogs, and you need to send a round through the bear's rump all the way into its heart to stop that from happening. Another example would be a bear that was accidentally gut shot and is now directly running away from you. In that situation, you'd want to make a lengthwise shot to make sure that you, first of all, recover the bear, and second of all, to ensure that it doesn't die a long, painful death from infection. If we are talking about bear defense, though, the argument for extremely deep penetration is far weaker. I don't believe a bullet is going to do anything particularly useful if it continues to penetrate and do damage after it leaves vitals and starts going through guts. This is not a theoretical situation in the least, because from the picture I showed before, we know that with the right ammunition, a 10mm can penetrate completely through a grizzly. So in my opinion, I don't believe anymore that a hard cast round is the best bullet for bear defense. If a hollow point stays together where a hard cast may shatter, that's a fundamental problem for me. As for defining what the best bear defense round would be, that's a bit more difficult. Other people have different opinions and things that they want that round to do. For example, Tim Sundles, who is the founder and owner of Buffalo Boar Ammunition, prefers to carry a 500 line ball revolver in grizzly country. He also says that the minimum caliber he'd take there is 454 Casul. More specifically, he likes to use heavy bullets that are made out of hard cast lead and have a wide flat nose. He also talked with a state trooper who mentioned that all the troopers were using 220 grain hardcast buffalo bore 10mm ammunition, as well as the fact that that trooper had investigated 5 grizzly kills and 5 moose kills that those 10mm rounds successfully stopped and killed attacking animals. For people who have absolutely no interest in buying a 500 lion maw or 454 casul because of recoil and practicality concerns, Tim Sundle's criteria are good to know, but ultimately not really useful. I totally understand his logic and appreciate his opinion, but I come at this from a different angle. He mentioned in that interview that he has killed a number of bears, so he has experience and knowledge of the matter that he can base his opinion off of. So he'd be able to stress the importance of why 454 and 500 Lion Ball achieve some specific effect that other calibers just don't do, and that's why they would be superior. However, he didn't do that. This leads me to conclude that his belief that a 454 is the absolute minimum for grizzly defense is not actually based on any specific knowledge or experience. It is an arbitrary standard. Likewise, I could say that a 500 Smith & Wesson is the best bear defense handgun caliber, and base that conclusion on zero practical experience, and only the amount of energy it has. Let's say we had a specific standard to meet though, the ability for a round to penetrate into a bear's skull. It actually takes very little energy to accomplish this, so a 454 Casul is not needed to meet this goal. Eskimos, for example, would hunt and kill polar bears with 22 rifles, with what was in all likelihood average soft lead round nose bullets. 
I know someone will feel the need to dismiss that information based on some existing belief of theirs, so I would like to remind you that polar bear skulls are in fact more sloped than grizzly and brown bear skulls, so deflection off the skull is actually more likely with polar bears. If you pause the video and read the quotes that I have here, you will realize that it's not extremely high skill that allowed Eskimos to accomplish this. They did make mistakes sometimes, and because of that, some would suffer a painful death in a polar bear's jaws. Putting it simply, bear skulls are actually not that hard to penetrate, and if you know the anatomy of an animal and you can shoot well enough, it's actually not hard to kill a polar bear if you really know what you're doing. This is a halved Kodiak brown bear skull. If you look closely, you can see the densest and thickest bone is actually at the very top and rear of the skull. The forehead looks very thick, but the bone there is not very dense. It's only the outer part of the forehead that has any real amount of density, and even then the dense bone is not very thick for much of the forehead, so it's really no match for a good projectile. I want to remind you as well that bears tend to charge with their heads down, but they don't always do this. So a bear that is pointing its head directly at you, you'd want to shoot right through its nose to reach the brain. But if it's angling its head down towards the ground as it charges, you may have to shoot through the forehead itself. Of course, this heavily depends on your position and the bear's position. So penetrating a bear's skull is a relatively low standard. A higher standard would be a round that stays together when shot through bone, has the ability to break bone, and inflicts more damage on flesh. The reasons for this are obvious. More damage to the vitals is better than less damage. The ability to break bone is important in my opinion because a bear's brain is kind of a small target and difficult to hit when it's running at you as its head bobs up and down with each stride. So the idea is that if you hit a bear with an expanding bullet anywhere on its leg or on the socket of its shoulder, that will result in a broken bone. And if you break both shoulders or front legs of a bear, it is pretty much incapacitated unless you are already underneath the bear. In this video, this person shot three different types of expanding 22 rounds into a cow scapula or shoulder bone. None of them broke the bone, even though all of them had proven to be capable of breaking thicker bone right before this shoulder bone test. With that in mind, I wanted to show you this picture of a brown bear skull that was shot with extreme penetrator, non-expanding rounds. The hole in the top of the skull was made with a 44 Magnum, and the hole in the front was made with a 10 millimeter. Obviously, the 44 Magnum has more power and a larger bullet diameter, yet the 10 millimeter cracked the skull more and made a bigger hole. So the explanation for this is that the 10 millimeter encountered more resistance due to the thickness and angle of the bone, which allowed more of the 10 millimeters force to transfer directly into the bone. So the flat part of the shoulder, the shoulder blade itself, can be really thin in places. The area I colored in red is where it's particularly thin, and it appears to be thin enough there that it can crack just during the drying process. As for the line of protruding bone that goes up the length of the shoulder, that's about 4 millimeters thick from my grid measurements. This of course heavily depends on what part you measure and how big the bear is. So the best part of the shoulder to shoot is the socket itself, because it's very thick there and will transfer a lot of the energy directly into breaking bone. 